and here in 2 Timothy 4, we're going to continue looking at the first five verses here. So our reading will be chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. If you haven't said amen. amen. Let's read. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in his season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Amen. Now, as we continue looking here at this passage in 2 Timothy, I want to kind of remind us of you know, what we had been looking at before, of where in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul had laid out a series of warnings about what was going to happen to the body of Christ and how the members of the body of Christ were going to be turning away from the truth of what God's word had laid out for this dispensation. And we're going to have all of those different things that were going to start occurring with them. And as he starts chapter 4, it's really that issue of, okay, here's that warning, but here's how you're going to keep yourselves going, set way, all of those things I just warned you about, that's not going to be true of you as the members of the body of Christ. Now, when we look at all of those things, I want to say this as part of it, that the local assembly plays a huge role in what we see laid out here in these first five verses of 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Because without the local assembly, and, and those who are, you know, are kind of the, other, the quote unquote stranded grace believers, as you know, I've heard that phrase get used by individuals where you know, the closest church might be you know, three, four hundred miles away and I'm the only one who understands all this. It can be very lonely, you know, knowing that, okay, I don't have anybody else to be, you know, sharing, you know, to be talking about these things, to be learning from them, all of those things that, you know, need to happen as part of that local assembly. So, you know, the local assembly is a vital part of what is needed for everyone in, you know, in this dispensation. You know, you know, that's you know, the responsibility we have is to make sure that the local assembly you know, keeps going, you know, not only for our generation, but for the generations to follow. So that way they have the place to come to be able to have all of these things occur for themselves. And where we left off last time, we kind of talked about you know, some of the things of you know, that in season and out of season, and how, you know, it's easy to, you know, be able to stand for the truth of God's word, you know, when I'm around people who think the same way and, and have those same beliefs, and, you know, when I'm outside of that and I'm in that out of season, then the difficulty that happens, you know, especially if I'm, you know, whether I'm out in the world system or I'm in, you know, the Christian circle that doesn't understand God's word rightly divided, and both of those systems, it is very difficult for the believer to you know, be standing for the truth of God's word rightly divided. And Paul's saying, you, know, you have to make sure you have that foundation for yourself so that way you can get through that time of the out of season because you know, you're not always going to be in season where it's easy. You know, you're going to be in those opportunities where it is hard. You have to be ready to be in those places. 
And from here, he actually starts talking about some things that when he says, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And so he lists out these three things here to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And all of these things are going to happen with. Long suffering and doctrine that's going to be needed as I'm reproving, rebuking, and exhorting individuals. And, and that's why Paul starts, you know, we spend so much time focusing on how he started there of to preach. The word. Because when I'm going to reprove someone, and we'll, we'll get into this in a few minutes, the only way I can reprove someone is with the word of God rightly divided. <laughs> if I'm going to rebuke someone, it's going to be with the word of God rightly divided. And if I'm going to exhort someone, it's going to be with the word of God rightly divided. That's why he points to the issue of that it's with long suffering and doctrine. I need the doctrine in order to be able to do all of these things. And all of these are going to come from all of the members of the body of Christ. This is not the responsibility of, well, you know, there's the pastors and the deacons, and, you know, it's their responsibility to reprove and exhort individuals, and, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't need to do any of that. Well, there's sometimes how we use, for example, you know, the idea of exhorting when we get to there. You know, sometimes the pastors and the deacons need that too. <laughs> And, you know, and sometimes it's, it needs to come from somebody in the assembly to help to exhort the people who are in those positions you know, of authority in the local assembly. You know, and that's what you know, they need to come from and because you know, they can't really exhort themselves. <sighs> sometimes they need it to come from the outside. But we'll start with the idea of to reprove. And you know, what we're going to see as we look at this, that these first two are really going to be kind of almost a step one and a step two of what happens. And the idea is that for the reproof is that I'm going to be explaining to someone what the Word of God is saying. And in order to do that, one of the things that has to happen first Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. <clears throat> and here in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, let's read here verse number 13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And the important part of you know, what Paul is saying here to this church at Thessalonica is saying, you know, I came, I taught some things, and you accepted what was being taught as being the word of God which was going to have an effect on your life. 
They didn't look at us. Well, you know, here comes here comes Paul saying those saying those crazy things again. Mm. Or here comes Paul teaching his own philosophy. You know, and following it as the philosophy of man. Because you know, man has a philosophy, man has a wisdom. But it doesn't produce what the Word of God actually produces in the life of an individual. So, in order to reprove and also to rebuke and exhort someone, you know, they need the Word of God. They need to understand that they have the Word of God. Because if, what if they don't even think that this is the Word of God? You know, it's kind of hard to reprove someone when they don't even think they have the Word of God. You know, that's where you know, we talk about the, the Bible issue when it comes up. Because you know, if, a lot of the translations that are out there, the modern translations, when they change those words, it has an impact on the doctrine. You know, that's why they change the words. It's because you know, most of the time they have a doctrine that they want to put out there. So you know, the easiest way to get that doctrine out there is, well, if I change this word here and this word here, well, now it says something different. That's right. Or, well, you know, it says this. But, you know, it doesn't really mean <laughs> what that word says. The, intent, the, intent. the word really means this. Or, well, you know, here's the, you know, that, that English word you're reading here. Well, the Greek word is this. And that Greek word means this. And because that Greek word means this, it's a little bit of a different meaning than what the, So that verse doesn't mean what you say it means. It means something different. And because I know Greek and you don't, who becomes the authority? Well, this person who thinks that they know Greek. Now, the mention of Roman Greek lexicon. Well, the majority of them, at best, their, their understanding of Greek is about the equivalent of a student who's completed fourth grade and having their understanding of the English language after fourth grade. Amen. Yeah. Now, right. Is there anyone in this room who would say a fourth grader is an expert in the English language after they graduate fourth grade, move on to fifth grade? No. No. You know, well, most people who complete high school aren't experts in the English language. But individuals become this expert because they bought a $20 Greek lexicon and looked up a couple words at home and made us that way they became this authority. The moment you start doing that, what it does is it makes you question what you have in front of you. And now I can't go home. I can't study it on my own. I can't even read it on my own. I need that person that's standing right there to actually interpret it for me, to teach things to me rather than allowing the Word of God to actually work you because I have the Word of God Amen. in my language that I can read, study, understand, and allow to have an impact in my life. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter number 4. And here in Ephesians 4, well, what, as we go here, we use this as an example of when I talk about that idea of reproving, which is the idea of 
giving someone some doctrinal information that's, you know, they probably understand, but to help apply it to their life. So you know, I'm going to pick on, you know, I'm going to pick on who I usually pick on, Brother Jack in the back. <laughs> so, you know, I see, you know, Brother Jack, you know, having an interaction with someone in this neighborhood. You know, and unfortunately, Brother Jack's having a bad day. And he, and he's just screaming at one of his neighbors, and just yelling at him. You can see the anger just written all over his face as he's dealing with this individual. Now, I know that Jack it isn't like that, but let's kind of pretend for a second that he is. One thing that as a Reproof is I would go here to Ephesians chapter 4. And let's read here verse number 31. And it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say to, you know, you know get rid of all that. He also says, but here's what you're supposed to do in verse 32, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And that's what's pointed out to him to kind of say, you know, this is you know, really what you should be applying to your life to, you know, and when you start feeling that blood inside of you starting to boil and you're, you know, you're getting angry, this is what you need to think about. You know, that you're to put off those things and that you're supposed to behave the way that verse 32 is talking about and you're supposed to behave that way because you've already received that forgiveness. Which it, and that's a big distinction when we talk about the biblical distinctions. When you look at back here, they're still waiting for their forgiveness in Israel's program. Like their forgiveness doesn't come and so in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, when it identifies that the times of refreshing shall come. That's all the way over here when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth. That's when their forgiveness actually occurs. But the Apostle Paul tells us in this dispensation, we already have the forgiveness. It's a present possession of us. We've already been forgiven. So our motivation is to forgive someone because we already have received the forgiveness. For them it was, you know what? You better forgive that person. Because if you don't forgive him, God's not going to forgive you. And if God doesn't forgive you, you know what that means. Mm -hmm. That means that sin's still part of your life. We already have the forgiveness. And we have that because sin is no longer imputed to our account. Mm -hmm. And because it's no longer imputed to our account, and we have that forgiveness, we can now be motivated by the love that we're to have for other people, and not be motivated by fear. Fear that God's going to do something to me if I don't walk right. You know, the idea of reproving is needed because there are things that we do, and there's a couple terms that Paul uses. We're here in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's just look up one verse. Here we read verses 31 and 32. Let's read verse 30. It says, And grieve not 
the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. There are things that we can do that can grieve the Spirit of God. In the book of in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it identifies that you know, an individual can quench the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 2, it talks about the idea of an individual frustrating the grace of God. There are things that individuals, unfortunately, in this dispensation as members of the body of Christ, can do that do all of those things. That's why when Paul prays, for individuals. He prays you know, for an increase in knowledge for people. So that way the increase of knowledge can affect the walk of the individual. So that way they know what it is that they're supposed to do. God's will you know, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go there. First Timothy chapter 2, we're going to read here verses 3 and 4. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So God's will is that all men would be saved and that they would come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, let's look at this for a second. Does everybody come unto the knowledge of the truth? No. Unfortunately, the answer is no. I wish it was yes, but the answer is, is no. The other piece of that thing of is are all men saved? And again, you know, wish the answer was yes, but the sad answer to that is no. Everyone has the opportunity to receive salvation. You know, for the grace of God to, which brings salvation hath appeared to all men. It's there, the opportunity for salvation is that. You know, person puts their trust in the fact that Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And putting their trust in that and that alone would give them their salvation. They have the opportunity, but unfortunately, you know, people don't always accept that. And even the ones that accept that, because really the second part of that of verse 4 can't happen without the first part, you know, because a person can't come unto the knowledge of the truth without salvation first. So you have a, a big pool of people out there, a portion of them get saved, and only a portion of that small portion actually come to the knowledge of the truth. But again, it's an opportunity that everybody has. And how somebody comes unto that knowledge, let's go over to Romans chapter 12. And this is why when we talk about this idea of reproving that it's needed In Romans chapter 12, where we hear the, verse, the first two verses of the chapter, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The transformation that is needed comes in the mind. An individual is made up of three parts. An individual is made up of a body, a soul, and a spirit. The law. work to try to bring the body under subjection. And as the body would become under subjection, the rest of that would follow. Did that work? No. No. And scriptures are filled over and over again of the proof that the law did not work. Because when a person became guilty of one part of the law, they were guilty of it all. <clears throat> There's over 600 parts of the law. Right? And if you're going to attempt, you know, it's not just as people say, well, keep the Ten Commandments. Well, that's just 10 of the 600 plus parts of the law. You know, and most people can't even keep the Ten Commandments, uh, let alone the other parts of the law. And it was why I've never killed anyone. Well, okay. But let's, you know, let's look at, you know, have you kept the this, this Sabbath day holy, which is part of the law? And chances are, no, because you... Most people don't even understand what the Sabbath day really is. That the Sabbath day would technically be from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. You know, it never got changed to, well, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ changed the Sabbath day from, from Saturday to the Lord's day on Sunday. No. Never happened. You know, the Sabbath is the Sabbath. If you Broken that, you're guilty of the whole law. If you had a piece of bacon, you've broken the law. All of those things prove that this doesn't work. However, the grace of God doesn't work this way. But the grace of God works in the issue of the renewing of the mind. The grace of God works. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let's see, we're going to read verses 12 and 13. It says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So, the grace of God, the Spirit works here to compare spiritual things with spiritual to start having the impact not this way, but having the impact this way. And it has the impact this way because in God's eyes, this is already dead. 
and this is already dead, God's not going to work there. God's going to work on the part where he has given us the gift of eternal life. He's going to work in the spirit. That's why there's a transformation that starts to occur. That's why we need the word of God. We need to have you know, that reproof sometimes of, well, here's what the doctrine really says on something. We get that, you know, as we do our own study, we get that from other members of the body of Christ who help to give us the information that we need. Because it's only the Word of God that can have that impact because the Word of God is what produces faith in the life of an individual. But unfortunately... Sometimes it's, you know, it goes beyond the reproving. And it has to get to the actual rebuke that actually has to occur. And that happens. Let's go over to Titus chapter number one. Here in Titus chapter number 1, we're going to start here at verse number 10. It says, For there are many unruly and mean talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of them sounds, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. And so we see this thing, and I'm going to label this thing, we're going to come back to this passage in a minute here, that there's a rebuke that has to occur related to the false teachers that are out there. But I want to bring up the other category here. And let's go over to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Hold your hand in tight as we're coming right back. And in 1 Timothy chapter number 5, in verse 20, it says, Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. Now, let's go back to Titus for a moment. And I want to focus on how Paul says that that rebuke is supposed to come. And it says, Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Now, the goal of this rebuke right, right. is that the individual would become sound in the faith. Amen. So, if the idea of rebuking them sharply is to get up in somebody's face and start yelling and screaming and letting your face turn all, you know, 12 shades of red and get to the point of where as you're talking, you're so worked up, the words aren't even coming out in the order that you want them to come out. You know, is that rebuking someone sharply that would accomplish what the Apostle Paul is saying is that they may be sound in the faith. No. Absolutely not. 
Or is a sharp rebuke to say, Brother, I'd like to sit down with you, you know, at some point in time. I really would like to discuss this with you because you know, I have some scriptures here that really would go against everything that you're saying. And I would like to spend some time to lay this out with you, to have a clear discussion about this issue. And then actually sitting down with the person discussing and using the Word of God to actually have that discussion in order to accomplish the goal of having, you know, hopefully bringing that soundness in the faith to actually occur. Now, I say it this way, and everyone goes, the second one is exactly what now here's the reality of what happens. Someone starts teaching something that's not sound in the faith. And people who say the second one is what we should do, do the first one. And yell and scream and call the person names and do all sorts of things. And, say, and then when asked about why they're doing it, I'm rebuking them sharply. Because that's what the Apostle Paul said I'm supposed to do. The idea is that, you know, one, the person's still a brother in the Lord. The goal is to bring that soundness in the faith. The only thing that can actually have the impact is the Word of God. Nothing I do is that the only thing I can do is take the focus off of the Word of God. And if I'm yelling and screaming at someone, the focus isn't on the Word of God. The verses <coughs> are the Word of God. The Word, you know, that's why, I, and yes, I know this verse that I'm going to read comes from the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to say that. But in Hebrews chapter 4, and I'm going to read verse 12, where it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what the Word of God is. This is why when you look in Ephesians chapter 6, and, and Paul's talking about preparing someone to stand against the wiles of the devil, and talking about that battle that we're going to have that's going to be you know, in the spiritual realm, and the preparation that comes in putting on the armor of God. And you see all the different things that... The, that there's only one offensive weapon that the person is given. And that's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Because the Word of God is what's going to accomplish all of those things. It's going to accomplish what we just read in the book of Hebrews. And it's the only thing that's going to accomplish what we're talking about here in Titus of where an individual is going to be brought to the soundness and faith because the Word of God has worked in them. Mm -hmm. Now, the second one, and I brought this one up because the people go, well, you know, <clears throat> Paul says we're to rebuke those that sin. You know, you know, and it says right, right there in the book, right before we we're studying, think that, you know, we have to confront sin right when it happens. Let's go over to Galatians chapter number 6. And let's read here verse number 1. 
of Galatians 6. It says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of yelling and screaming at them. <laughs> yeah. mm. It says, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, meekness does not mean weakness. Meekness means that I'm putting, I'm taking myself and putting me over here because what is going to have the impact is going to be the Word of God that's actually going to work. Mm -hmm. That, when I'm doing that, that's when we talk about Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that you know, Christ living, you're living out of us. That's how that occurs. Mm -hmm. Because the Word is what's actually going to have the impact. Whether it's the doctrinal issue or whether it's the behavioral issue, it's the word that's going to work. Because and that sin, let's Paul defines that sin in Romans chapter 14. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So, if sin is whatsoever is not of faith, what's the solution to fixing that sin? The Word of God. The, well, the Word of God, because the Word of God is going to produce faith. faith. If they don't have faith, faith is what they need. Yes, sir. And the, where they're going to get faith from is the Word, the Word of God. And they're going to get the Word of God by that sharp rebuke that's, yes. brother, yes. let's sit down for a minute. And I'm just going to share some verses with you. And we're going to kind of talk about you know, what it is that I'm seeing. And let the Word of God yes. actually work and have the effect on the individual. Because it's, you know, again, I'm not going to have that influence. The Word of God is what's going to have the influence because it's the Holy Ghost that's teaching. Yes. It's yes. the Holy Ghost that's comparing the spiritual things to the spiritual things inside of the individual. Yes, yeah. You know, I, I like it too if you watch the, the old cartoons, you know, I think where all of a sudden someone would have that idea and the little light bulb would appear over their head. You know, <laughs> that you know think oh, I got that you know, brilliant idea. That's what the Holy Ghost is mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. and you know with you as you're reading and studying and uh, and, and probably everyone has had this. I know I've had it where you have that verse where you go, I just don't know what this means. And, you know, and studying and studying, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, so many months down the road, you, you're reading and studying something else, and I also feel like that light just went on Absolutely. related to that question that you had months before. Absolutely. That's the Holy Ghost working in you to give you that insight because you've worked and studied the Word of God. And so now there's enough Word in you to be able to compare the spiritual things with the spiritual things so you can understand yes. what this actually means. Yes. And Sometimes it also comes from a thing of where, you know, there's things that I might not understand. And Deacon Steve has, you know, has the insight into it. You know, 
I, you know, I listen and I learn from the insight that he has into those passages as well. We talked about reprove, rebuke. We've got one more. And the idea of to exhort. And the idea of exhortation is that the issue of to encourage an individual. Now, let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, I read here in verse number 5. It says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty, not as of covetousness. Now, I don't want to focus so much on you know, the issue of, you know, as Paul's talking about giving. Uh, there, that's a completely different message. Uh, yeah. I want to focus on this, this issue of that Paul found it necessary that he had to exhort. He had to encourage them to be able to do this. And you see Paul brings this up. He, the church at Thessalonica, he talks about how he exhorted them. <clears throat> he talks about how that's one of the requirements of someone who would fulfill the office of a bishop, that they would be able to exhort the brethren, that they would be able to encourage, you know, we talked about the announcements and prayer requests or this morning, you know, and people talk about, you know, some of the struggles that, you know, the day-to-day -day life brings up. There needs to be an encouragement, an exhortation that we all need that comes from the Word of God in order to get through the things that happen in our day-to-day -day lives. Because life isn't easy. And we all need encouragement at times to keep going. Yes. That's why when he says up here it is with all long suffering and doctrine. Because you know, it's not oh, you know what I became a believer today and my life is gonna be so easy. <laughs> because because I've accepted I, I've accepted the gospel and there's all these passages that talk about the blessings that come from following what God says. All those physical blessings are all the things that are talked about here in the prophecy program. Because what we've been given is all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. We weren't given all physical blessings in earthly places. If we were, life would be, you know, especially the fact that we're guaranteed our salvation, I think life would be a whole lot easier. But it's not, because we're given spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And Paul talks over and over again about how we're going to suffer for his sake. That we've been made partakers of the suffering. The fact that you know, part of that fruit of the Spirit is long suffering. Not short suffering, but long suffering. Now, it's part of that encouragement is that we're called, if it's all long suffering, it's all these bad things that come on. You know, how do we do it? You know, it's not worth it. It's not worth doing all this. Well, you know, Paul, 
actually answers that question. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And this is a passage that, you know, sometimes when somebody's right in the middle of something, it's hard to really grasp what Paul's saying here. But in chapter 4, we read here, verse, starting in verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, but the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We go, what? Well, yeah. But Paul didn't understand. You know, what I'm going through, it's not white. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not a moment. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for weeks and months. Well, it's for a moment. And let's start with that piece of it first, because... Our life that's here, let's say we even live to be 110 years old. You know, that we live as long as some of the oldest people that are, that are, that are on earth live to be. 110 years old. Now let's compare 110 years with all of eternity. Is 110 years a long time? No. So even that... So, if I suffer for a week, out of that 110 years with something, even that's a small portion of that 110 years, and an even smaller portion of all of eternity. Now, it's hard to look at it that way when I'm in the middle of whatever the problem is and say, it's but for a moment. And it's hard a lot of times when I'm going to build a problem. Though. It's light affliction. Mm. Because it seems like it's the, and whatever it is, it's the end of the world. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to get through this. Well, God's the God of all comfort. God provides the comfort for us to be able to get through whatever the situation is. No matter how bad it is, God's Word can provide that comfort. And part of you know, our responsibility is when we see that things are, is to encourage someone and to be able to give them that, you know, let, you know, let me just give you a, a verse or two of Scripture and be able to give someone that Word of God to be able to provide the comfort that they need. Because what happens is, and what the world tries to do is, let's find comfort in everything else other than the Word of God. That's the truth. Yeah, that's the truth. And Paul's saying, no. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get through things, you need to get through it using the Word of God. You need to focus on the doctrine. Because if you start going to those things that you know, outside of the doctrine to get that comfort, and I'm a believer, well, I got my comfort from over here. Now all of a sudden the focus starts to become on the things over here and not on the things that come from the Word of God. <clears throat> and that's where the breakdown for the individual can start to occur because now I'm being pulled away. That's what Satan wants. Satan, because he knows he can't do anything to impact our salvation. But what can he, he can affect is our effectiveness 
and being able to teach others the doctrine for this dispensation. So anything that can be done to just kind of put the hook in someone and pull them away from the Word of God is going to be done. And that's why Paul is saying, you know what? Keep the Word and the focus and the reproof, the rebuke, and the exhortation all comes from the long-suffering and the doctrine that's laid out in Romans through finally. And having said that, we'll open up the floor for questions and comments. Go ahead, Jackie. Yeah, you 